Yo, wonderful people! Thank you very much for clicking, man. You are loved and respected. You see, today we shall be reacting together through different types of videos animal videos, good vibes videos, videos that make you smile in the middle of a tough day, you see? And those videos that are intended to show peace and love, all with the intentions of spreading love peace and showing the importance of unity and forgiveness among humans across the whole world you see and with your help wonderful soul we can spread this message of love across the whole world can you watch till the end straight out of africa good vibes lots of good vibes tell us where you're watching from and hit the like button let's dive in man good vibes till the end good vibes Huh, a plasma frame where I see lights energy saving lamps. Huh, let's see. How is that even uh, possible? Oh my god, huh? This light is electronically charged. Oh my god, this is interesting. Wow, this is wonderful. Ha! Did you know this is possible? Oh my god. Ah, god. Man, good vibes to the end. Much Can love you to yourself, man. you see leaves ruled in black like this? Especially in Roman font. Though black letter examples are certainly found, you should be immediately thinking to yourself, 17th century. Ah, oh my god. I didn't know that. That is Before new. you spend money, wait for 24 hours and ask yourself, do I still want it? If you do, go ahead and buy it. Here's the secret. Paramagnetic ch materials change based on geometrical structure. This is a piece of sandpaper. No magnet will stick to it. And yet if I were to suspend it by a string and move a magnet close to it, it would move towards it based on its geometrical structure alone. OK? This happens on a macrocosmic scale with this, with that tower. It also happens on a macrocosmic scale. If you're to study bismuth, you would under, uh, I, I can't tell you about the studies in that, but I can tell you that study it, and you will discover that magnetism, paramagnetism, conductivity, and this is in your notes, conductivity and superconductivity all are contingent on the geometrical structure of the element that you're working with, OK? Uh, bismuth turns heat into heat and cold into energy based on its structure. A superconductor will conduct energy based on its crystalline structure. A magnet is a magnet because of its crystalline structure. You take away its crystalline structure, it's no longer a magnet. You give it back its crystalline structure, it's a magnet. Okay? This is one of the most important things that you will ever realize if you're going to build a magnetic motor if you're going to uh, build something that's going to energize your yard, it all comes back to geometrical patterns, okay? Our thoughts are geometrical patterns. Remember how I said, I put up that picture at the very beginning and said, I want to, I want to imprint everybody with a, with a thought pattern, okay? Literally, that thought pattern, that thought in your mind is going around creating a geometrical pattern in your thoughts, in your, in your head, yes? Yes, chemical, chemical reactions are also geometrical patterns, too. And I'm I, I, I should have brought that up then. As we, change the, the, uh, as, we change, as we input chemicals, we add more and more complex patterns to our water, and that is what causes the, uh, that's what causes the, the harmful side effects of water. I will show you um, in a little bit uh, water that is so high pH, it would be like drinking lye, and, and yet I can put it on my hands and splash it on my face. Because the geometrical pattern is not such that it would destroy me. The geometrical pattern is such that it actually is beneficial to me, OK? It all comes back to patterns. It all comes back to how things move in the universe, yes? So uh, let's take a look at magnets really quick. Um, para uh, magnets versus paramagnetics. Um, it's been documented over and over again that if you take a a south pole magnet and put it on a, uh, let's say, oh, I, I love this one, a, a little styrofoam container of, of bait worms. 
they will start to literally become carnivorous and eat their way out of the styrofoam container. However, if you flip the, uh, if you flip the magnet around to the North Pole side, it won't do that. If you put live blood analysis, uh, I talked about last year, dark field microscopy. If you put a, a piece of your live blood on the, on the slide and you pass a south field magnet across it, it will kill the blood. It will just destroy it. That blood is, is not functional. If you switch that magnet around and, shine, and put the North Pole magnet against it, it will be beneficial to the body. Okay, so you have to be careful about magnets. Paramagnetic is, not, is, is, is completely different. It's literally um, exactly like us, so it gives us energy. You don't have to worry about poles. Oh my God, you see, magnetism is very interesting. Well, the reason they couldn't mention stars or take photographs of stars is that the astronomy buffs at Vanderbilt or Harvard or UCSC would have found the errors instantly. His friend, you know, the person who spoke with him here. Right. Do you yeah. want me to mention him by name? I think so. Okay, why yeah. not? Yeah. <clears throat> of course, Lee is kind of a reclusive person, but I don't mind mentioning his name. We can. We can't live forever. <laughs> <clears throat> Ready? Yeah. James Irwin was the command pilot on Apollo 13, on a, pardon me, on Apollo 15. Uh, James, after his return from the moon, became a born-again Christian. At one point, he came to Nashville, Tennessee, to give a lecture on Christianity and his conversion there, too. And at that time, he met a local Nashville resident by the name of Lee Galvani. Well, Lee implored James Irwin to confess, to tell the truth about the Apollo hoax, of which Lee was convinced. Well, evidently, he made some inroads in, into Jim Irwin's conscience because in August of 1991, James Irwin called me at my home. And he said, I understand you've written a, a, a book called We Never Went to the Moon. He says, come to think of it, this phone could be tapped. He says, I want you to call me at my home on Friday in, in, uh, in uh, Colorado Springs, Colorado. So I said, okay, Jim, I'll call you. And he gave me his home phone number. Well, when I called him on Friday, James Irwin was dead. He had died of a heart attack. Tell me about the pilot who uh, phoned in one of your uh, guest appearances on the talk radio program. Oh. While I was on a radio show concerning Apollo, an airline pilot called me and he said, Bill, I think you're right, because while I was traveling from San Francisco to Tokyo, we saw a C-5A drop a capsule out of its cargo hold the orange, three orange paras, parachutes opened and it descended toward the ocean. And even though we were traveling at about 550 knots, we followed this descent as long as we could. Uh, when the command capsule returns to Earth, the atmosphere causes it to become red hot due to friction at high speed. Well, when a command capsule strikes an ocean, which is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, this red-hot capsule should have turned a large volume of seawater into steam instantly, just like when you pour water into a hot pot on the stove, it immediately, it's called flashing into steam. But in all of the photographs showing the capsule hitting the water, there's no indication whatsoever of any steam, of any indication that the capsule was really red hot. On December 7th, 1975, I was invited to discuss my book at radio station KOME in San Jose, California. The moderator or talk show host was Victor Bach. About halfway through the broadcast, the engineer came into the control room, or the room where we were giving our uh, our information and he said we're off the air subsequent 
in, uh, subsequent investigation indicated that someone in a helicopter had dropped napalm on the KOME transmitter in the Gilroy Hills, causing a quarter of a million dollars worth of damage and effectively cutting off the station from the air for three days. Well, police came to the station and offered us police protection because callers into the station said, what happened to you? You had this fellow on about, we never went to the moon, and suddenly your radio station goes off the air. So to me, this was the first real life indication that there was somebody that didn't want me to tell this story. Oh my God, what? Well, oh. That is magic, huh? Where did you see it? Oh, what's up with the dog? Why is it uh, studying like this? It has dirt on its foot or what? Oh my God! What? Hey, this is a um, special type of a dog. Oh, huh? it can't walk with the dirt on their legs. Oh my God! Oh man, this is amazing. You see, from this side of the world, dogs, people, everybody is used to work on that, you see? And sometimes, most people do it barefoot. Oh. I'm surprised that dog could refuse to do that. Well, it may have a hard time coming here. To, to starting to break up here. And, uh, like, where aren't we right now? What planet is this? Just take a folk picture. I like how it, that Earth is beating the glacier. You see that interesting shape? Oh wow, it's yeah. Making. Just mesmerized. I've never seen terrain like this. It's so insane, isn't it? How because this is right at the edge of it. It's pools of water. That pool of ice. Like cold. I don't even know what I, I hear. Not like nothing you've ever seen. Uh, uh, nothing like nothing. It blows away anything we've seen so far. I'm just like blown away looking up at the at the walls and the peaks next to us. Oh man, the ice below us is <laughs> That's like the Grand Canyon of ice. Yep. Oh my god! Oh! That is uh, too much snow! In nature, anything that flies has symmetry. And in the early days of human flight, mimicking nature made sense. But as we pushed onto ever higher speeds, our stubborn insistence on symmetry might have been a mistake. In the 1950s, a brilliant NASA engineer began to push for a radical new approach, proving theoretically and with prototypes that aircraft didn't have to be symmetrical. The implications of his work are profound. It suggests we should be flying a lot faster and more efficiently than we are today. aircraft had been getting faster. In 1920, the fastest plane could barely reach 300 kilometers an hour. By the 1940s, they were already flying three times as fast, but there seemed to be a limit beyond which they simply couldn't go. Pilots called it the sound barrier. Above a certain speed, aircraft stopped accelerating, control became increasingly difficult, and stress forces could even cause an aircraft to break apart in midair. But in 1947, a daring test pilot flew an experimental plane beyond the speed of sound, proving that the sound barrier wasn't a barrier at all. It's just that supersonic flight revolved around a different set of aerodynamic principles. In the decades that followed, engineers mastered the physics of flying supersonic, pushing speeds ever higher. But a new challenge emerged, designing an aircraft that would perform well in both flight regimes. Any aircraft optimized for supersonic flight would, by definition, fly poorly at subsonic speeds. Because the ideal wing at lower speeds was long and straight, but for supersonic flight it was thin or sharply swept, a shape that struggled to generate lift at lower speeds. 
Engineers struggled to find a solution, eventually coming up with a kind of wing that could transform in midair, functioning more like a straight wing at subsonic speeds and sweeping back for supersonic flight. But variable sweep wings created their own set of problems. Pivot mechanisms had to bear immense lift, rotational, and bending forces. Shifts in the center of lift had to be compensated for with larger stabilizers or other systems, all of which added weight and complexity, largely undoing performance gains. Variable sweep wings were only successfully applied to a small number of military aircraft, none of which are still produced today. The sound barrier might not have been an actual barrier, but it seemed that flying faster would always involve serious trade-offs. Mm. What? Oh my god! Oh. Jack, have you ever seen this? The creek is absolutely alive with these fucking worms, man. They are just swimming everywhere. Thousands and thousands of the fucking things. They're an actual worm. And I've never seen anything like it. The whole creek is just full of them. Look at them, there's thousands of other things. And we caught one in a bucket to see what it was. And I actually picked it up and it is actually like a centipede type worm. Check out the legs on this thing. It swims around around that bucket and it's got legs on it like a centipede, but it's an actual worm. I've never seen them in a creek before. The creek is alive with them. They're the weirdest thing. That's probably 200 mil long, 250 mil long. These big fucking centipede looking worms swimming around. Weird looking things. Over now. Look, guys, do you know what that is? Oh my god, it looks creepy, Look at this. man. You can see the power of God hit that baby, the toddler at the altar. Watch what happens to the rest of the church. Look at this. As you can see, Jesus stepped in the room with his glory and the people responded. For more Christian content, hit subscribe now. Oh man, what's up to all guys, man? Good boys. I've watched this probably 45 times and it, it seriously is like the craziest process to make something that I've ever seen. I mean, it took me almost to the very end of the video to even figure out what in the world they's even making. The working conditions look absolutely miserable. And, and it's gotta be so dangerous. I mean, half these guys, they're not even wearing shoes. Hot parts, I, gloves on when they probably shouldn't have gloves on, no gloves on when they should have gloves on. <laughs> What's really wild to me is it takes this much effort to make a tennis ball that my dog will have demolished in, in less than probably, probably 15 seconds. And I mean, it's just over with. <laughs> wow, ain't no way. Oh man, I didn't know how that, that sounded like this. That's piss poor work, piss poor work. I don't want to see that ever again. Tomorrow, we got to get our shit together. Y'all got to do better than that. All right, everybody line up, line up. Ducks on three, ducks on three. One, two, three, ducks. <laughs> you guys what the what in the world when dr joe said change your energy change your life he meant it this is day seven of me doing dr joe dispenza meditations every single day 
and I'm starting to see the shifts in my external world. So for day seven, I did the generating gratitude meditation and the music, the beat, the rhythm is actually the same one that I said I did not enjoy back in day three. But honestly, day seven, I'm getting used to it and I'm actually loving it. And it really helps me to tune in and like feel my heart open. This meditation is only 15 minutes, but it is incredibly amazing and so powerful for such a short session. And I just have to tell you what happened on this day when I did the generating gratitude meditation. So my friend and I went for brunch at this delicious place in Bali and we're having such a great time. And we see these two guys seated close to our table and they're just looking at us and we could tell that they were trying to catch our eye but we were just like literally in our own little world we're having fun having great conversations and all of that and we wanted to end the brunch with cocktails so we asked for the menu and again this place was full like we we're not the only people and we're definitely not the only women finally they catch our eye and we make a conversation and they just ask us where we're from our names and they're like do you want us to recommend a delicious cocktail for you and we're like yeah of course so they order these cocktails for us and we just start to have a really great conversation with these two men they were not sleazy and you know like they were not trying to get our numbers like they were just genuinely interested in hearing our stories and just connecting with us so the cocktails came and it was so so good and we just continued to have a great time with these guys and they're like by the way these cocktails are on the house and we're like oh no that's okay you know and they're like no we insist um we we own this place and we're like oh and again maybe they do this regularly who knows but that day they didn't have to do it to our table it was full there were other people but they still chose to sit with us connect with us get to know us and buy us cocktails so that was the first abundant thing that happened that day and i was like okay great um, we met these two amazing men. We got free cocktails. Like, that is abundance. And another thing that happened right after that was, like, this guy that I dated six years ago very briefly sent me a message. Like, he asked me how I was. And I'm like, I haven't talked to you in so long. Like, what made you reach out? And he's like, just wanted to see how you were and, you know, catch up. And I was like, that's not a coincidence. And I don't have any specific feelings for this guy. But it's just really good to, like, reconnect and be in, um, in each other's vicinity energetically again if that makes sense and then we went for dinner at this amazing italian place in bali called amici you should definitely go there next time you're in bali and tell them sulkina sent you okay but anyway my friend and i had the most delicious dinner and when we ordered dessert they gave us free mango sorbet and it was so good like my friend and i literally felt something when we eat it but it's just crazy how many free things and all the connections we made in just one day and just by connecting to that feeling of gratitude like i had the most magical day ever and i just loved being in flow and i just felt like things happened for me i didn't have to force people were like reciprocating that um magnetic energy that i was putting out and this is just proof that if you love life life will love you back like we didn't have to get these things for free like I've been to that dinner place a few times and I didn't get anything for free the last time but this time around it was just magical like we ordered a tiramisu and we got a mango sorbet for free and the people that we met that are now our friends like those connections are not coincidental and I'm just really excited to see where this meditation journey takes me again because it's only day seven like it's only been a week and i'm already experiencing these serendipitous connections and literally getting things for free like i don't care that i don't even really drink that much like getting free cocktails for brunch was amazing and getting a free dessert like a whole ass dessert is like that's something that i'm so grateful for so let me know if you're also doing this joe dispenza meditation journey i know that some of you are commenting and saying that you're on the journey as well um ask me any questions in the comments below and honestly the more the merrier like let's do this meditation together and let's let's experience all the magic that life has to offer all right thank you for watching and i'll see you tomorrow oh man hmm. did you know that was going on? oh my god man wonderful people thanks for watching up to this far man you are loved and respected. We'll see you many videos as past.
always good vibes, animal videos, some mind buggering videos, and that's it, the information that uh, myself I even didn't know. You see, anyways, all with the intention of spreading love, peace, unity, and forgiveness. You see, kindly watch till the end, hit the like button, and leave your comments. You can also hit the super tags, tell us where you're watching from. You see. That way we can grow together. Good vibes, man. You see, I'm always surprised by different things I see here and there. Like now, this old issue about snow always does my mind. You see, and I still can't clearly fathom how snow exists. You mean there's the white stuff that comes like rain, covers house, and it's cold? Oh, please, guys out there watching, if you can help us understand in the comment section. Whether there is no where you come from, you see? Just keep on watching, man. Good vibes. Huh. The magnet loses all of its momentum at the very last moment in a way that almost looks supernatural. It reminds me of a scene in the second Matrix movie where Neo stops bullets in midair. In this video, I will be exploring magnetic braking and levitation utilizing the inductance of large copper plates. These plates I picked up on eBay for a pretty reasonable price along with some very strong neodymium magnets. Together they behave in strange ways. Copper is not magnetic, so they don't exactly attract each other, but at the same time this magnet doesn't seem to want to slip off very quickly. It drags across the plate slowly, like it's moving through a thick fluid. It's even more interesting if I drop the magnet on the plate. It slows down mid-air and gently floats to the surface, when a magnetic field moves through copper and many other metals, it causes electrons to reorganize themselves and flow in a circular pattern perpendicular to the oncoming magnetic field. Of course, the electrons were perfectly happy being where they were before the magnet tried moving them around, and so they resist this movement by generating a temporary magnetic field of their own. There's no attraction or repulsion, just resistance to change. One way that we can prove this resistance is due to the flow of electricity is by replacing the copper plates with a copper coil. This coil of wire is not connected at the ends, and so it does not form a complete electrical circuit. When I drop a magnet through the center, there is no resistance. It falls through the coil as if it were not even there. You can do some interesting things like manually levitate a magnet above the surface. I'm doing this by holding a second magnet underneath the plate. It's not easy to make a magnet float in this way, but it is fun to practice. I found that using a very wide magnet on top and a smaller magnet underneath is the most controllable setup. I made a small stand to hold my copper plates out of wood and acrylic glass. The resistance to movement caused by the electrical inductance in the copper is the only reason this levitation is possible. On a surface without this property, a magnet will fly right off the side as soon as you try to lift it with a second magnet. Despite the resistance that we've seen to change, magnetic fields pass right through copper as if it were not even there, as we can see by how I'm able to rotate this small cube magnet from a long distance away, even with the copper plate separating the magnet in my hand. Replacing the disc magnet with this smaller cube in the earlier setup allows me to walk it across the surface like a little robot, and the motion damping provided by the copper gives me very precise control. Besides the generation of electricity, there are a few other practical applications for this sort of motion damping. High-speed trains and even some roller coasters use a magnetic braking system set up in a way very similar to this, with powerful magnets, usually electromagnets, elevated above a conductive surface. The magnets slow the vehicle down quickly without any surface-to-surface -surface friction that causes damage in conventional braking systems between brake pads and rotors. My favorite tabletop demonstration of magnetic braking is to swing a magnet toward a chunk of copper like a wrecking ball. The magnet loses all of its momentum at the very last moment in a way that almost looks supernatural. It reminds me of a scene in the second Matrix movie where Neo stops bullets in midair. What's really happening is of course the same thing that has happened in my other examples. The magnet's momentum is slowed by opposing magnetic fields generated by the flow of electrons in the copper. And since the electrical energy isn't being collected by a circuit for any useful purpose, it dissipates into the lump of copper as heat. So the copper actually gets warmer every time I swing the magnet toward it, but by such a small amount that measuring the change would be very difficult. Oh man, sounds interesting. Always 
in Indiana, a little boy was possessed by a demon and walked up the wall backwards. So this reaction video, this series, is going to show the accounts of a Catholic priest who was involved, the news were involved, and also CPS, Child Protective Services. Uh, last night, Check it we out. told you about a nine-year-old Indiana boy who apparently was doing some very shocking things, so much so that exorcism was involved. The Indianapolis Star, that state's biggest newspaper, is heavily covering the story, and a captain in the Gary, Indiana Police Force, Charles Austin, says the situation is credible. That is incredible. Joining us now from Chicago, Father Michael Maginot, a Catholic priest who has been dealing with the situation. So, Father, I want to keep this fact-based, what you know, what you saw, what you did. Start with the boy. What do you know about yeah. him? Actually, I have never met any of their children. The first time I heard about the incident was when, the, at, just after the boy walked up the wall backwards, um, there was a furor there, uh, people running out, calling for the police, security, the chaplain. He called me. I was in my uh, parish uh, uh, conducting a Bible study core class, and I got the call because I was on call for the uh, Catholic priest chaplain who was off at that time. And they called me in to do an exorcism. And okay, I said, let's, let, let me stop in that window. Did you see exorcism it? Exorcism okay. is a very rare and serious thing mm -hmm. that the Catholic the Church, and, and you have to go through a lot of hoops to, to get it approved, to get the people in. It disturbs yes. me a little bit that the boy involved, and this is according to the newspaper and other eyewitnesses, you know, was, was doing incredible things like walking up walls and things like that. But you yourself. Yes. You yourself never talked to the boy. Uh, why not? He was scared. Well, when I went went to uh, do the interview do. at the the home with the mother and the grandmother, I it was a four hour interview, and the first uh, two hours were basically just uh, getting information of all the occurrences and phenomena that was surrounding everything leading up to that incident at, at the emergency room in the hospital. The problem I'm having with this is, he number one, scared. you didn't see the boy. I think yeah, you got to cast that name out in Jesus' name. He didn't know how. In a tough way now in this country. Exorcism is a very serious thing. Very, very serious. Mm -hmm. I understand mm -hmm. you got permission from the bishop in your diocese mm -hmm. to do this. Mm -hmm. But it just seems to me that the story is not solid enough to go public with it. And there are a lot of people watching right now that say this is more mumbo jumbo from the Roman Catholic Church and no credibility here at all. Do you answer that? Well, the boys, the two boys and the girl were, one uh, was put into a lockdown psychological That's children's um, ward and the other two were taken to the Carmelite sisters who take care of foster children. What are they going And to do? so they were taken away from the parents and uh, from kids. the mother and the grandmother. And, uh, and so I didn't have access to them. And I discovered in the investigation that the mother was also possessed, mainly at the end, very end. I put the crucifix on her forehead and she began to convulse. As a Catholic priest for many years, you believe that there is something unworldly involved with this family. You do believe that. Mm -hmm. All right, Father. Yeah. So there you see the whole family was possessed. The Catholic priest was afraid he didn't know what to do. You got to cast those demons out in the name of Jesus. You got to have your authority. But if you don't have a relationship with God, bro, you'll be afraid too. So I'm going to do part two. It's going to give a little bit more detail about what happened. Comment below and click follow. Let's go. Oh my God, man. Huh. What happened there? That is good. These are the 12 zodiac signs. Inside you see the planets that rule. Now, I call these luminaries because they're not planets. I mean, we live on a giant plane, and these are just the stars that are revolving above our plane, okay? They're just revolving around the North Pole. Now, what's happening is uh, Mars rules Aries, Venus rules Taurus, Mercury rules Gemini, and so and so forth. You can see them all here. Now, the sun doesn't rule Aries, obviously Mars does, but the sun exalts here, the moon exalts here, Jupiter exalts in Cancer, Saturn exalts in Libra, Mars exalts in Capricorn, Mercury exalts in Virgo, and Venus exalts in Pisces. So the point is, the sun takes a year to go around each sign, so it spends 30 days in each sign, 30 times 12 is 360, hence 365. The moon spends two to two and a half days in each sign, so it takes a month or 28 days. The Saturn takes 28 
years or 30 years to do a full cycle because it spends two to two and a half years in each sign. Jupiter spends one year in each sign. Jesus and his 12 apostles, because Jesus is you, it's humanity, and it's the sun, but it's also Jupiter, because Jesus versus Satan is Jupiter versus Saturn. So Jupiter and the 12 apostles takes 12 years to go around. Mars takes twice as long as Earth, and it's 720 days. That's two 360s. And Venus takes 225 days to go all the way around. I put Aries here all the way to Pisces, so it looks just like that. Aries all the way to Pisces. So we've given these constellations these, um, sh uh, you know, shapes or animals to represent them. Now, the point is this. The sun is 30 days in each sign, but look at Pluto. I haven't told you about Pluto. Pluto, it takes 248 years for Pluto to go around. So look, Pluto spends 11 to 31 years in each sign. So right now, Pluto is in Capricorn. It's 2021. So until 2024, Pluto will be in Aquarius. So, so Pluto is going around, around, around until it finally, it's in Capricorn and it's going to go to Aquarius. But, but remember this, Capricorn, see, Pluto doesn't just go one direction the whole time. It retrogrades, it goes back, then it goes forward, then it goes back, then Aquarius, then back. So it's going to go to Aquarius then it's going to go back to Capricorn. Then it's going to go back to Aquarius and finally keep going and then go back. So it's going to go in Aquarius for a little bit, put its feet in the water, and then finally sit in there. Pluto enters Aquarius for the first time in March of 2023. Then it goes backwards on May 2nd of 2023. Then Pluto goes back into Capricorn in June of 2023 until October of 2023. Then it returns to Aquarius in January of 2024. Then it does one final retrograde on May 2nd again, and then it enters Capricorn on September until October. Then it finally enters Aquarius again in November of uh, late 2024. Boom. The age of Aquarius. Oh my God. Huh. Did you know that about the Zodiacs? Myself, I did it. This man spotted something moving out in the water. As he got closer, he realized it was a raccoon swimming in the water, in the ocean. Oh my God. Oh, we checked to see if the raccoon was okay, and uh, he went under to take, wow, you see, this uh, raccoon was just fine, and it was swimming there. This is incredible. Uh, man, you mean this animal says this uh, was uh, intelligent, they can even swim in the ocean? Oh, my God. This is incredible, man. Oh, well, myself, uh, swimming is, eh, uh, hey, hey, wow, wow, myself, I don't know how to swim, you see? I usually convince myself by saying that if we are really meant to swim, we could at least have one fin. You see, I even if it's in the back here, one fin for navigating the waters there. But because you were born with the hands and legs, it looks like you are meant to be working. You see, but I'll teach myself soon. Please, if you guys know how to swim more than this raccoon, that is good, man. Leave some comments there. Do you have pets uh, know how to swim or have water? You see? I dare to know, man. Hmm. This man proceeded this mission of swimming. Hmm. Cut some land to cut some land for the raccoon. Hmm. You see? Oh, not want it to disturb the raccoon. The man paddled all the way back. Mommy is still sleeping. Oh, man. That guy must have been really tired for swimming in the ocean all that distance. Hmm. So what did this wonderful guy do? Oh, it's time to wake the raccoon because he has hitched. There somewhere where is the show. Hmm. This is great, man. Hmm. How long do you think it it had taken that animal to swim all that way the, in the ocean? Hmm. That is incredible, man. You mean these animals, uh, they don't fear water like that? All that uh, water and this animal usually works in the forest. Ha! And it's still okay and it swims and it has no water phobia. That is incredible. I'm surprised, man. Much love to that animal.